Um, if I understood the instructions for the prisoners correctly, we're not allowed to use other people's images unless we have explicit permission. So some of my figures are a little different from what they normally really need, but hopefully you can still figure that out. All right, so Holy Mammoths were some of the more plentiful, large herbivores during the Pleistocene and early Holocene. They were grazers, they populated the Siberian steppe and the North American plains. They defined the environment around them. At the height of their range, they extended all the way into Europe and into uh, northern China and through most of northern North America. <coughs> and then they all ended up going extinct because of a combination of climate change, where trees grew up over the steppes, and predation, including hunting by humans. But because of the environment in which they lived, we actually have very well preserved remains for woolly mammoths. There were uh, explorers in the Arctic who found woolly mammoths frozen in ice with soft tissue still attached. And then down in La Brea in LA, you can find the tar pits where woolly mammoths got trapped in the tar, or excuse me, Colombian mammoths got trapped in the tar, and they've been able to recover whole skeletons from multiple individuals. So even though these animals died tens of thousands of years ago, we still know a lot about their biology, their morphology, and where they lived. They can also be used as indicators of human presence. So they were an important uh, food source for ancient humans. Um, they hunted the mammoths. And in modern populations that hunt elephants, they'll often target the cheekbone where there's an artery that runs across the cheek, and it's the main blood supply for the trunk. And if you can hit that artery, it's one of the few ways to fell an elephant very quickly, which means that you avoid injury to anyone in the hunting party. And it also guarantees a kill, so you have something to eat. And they have these specimens that have these spear marks on the cheekbones, even in cases long before they can find any remains from humans or any artifacts and they can't recover the weapons. And so woolly mammoths are completely and totally awesome, and it would be cool if you could spend your entire career working on them, but some of us had parents who encouraged us to go get real jobs and support ourselves. And then one day something very magical happened, and that's that Elefiri Apocopolo in Lova Dawn's lab at the Swedish Museum of Natural History wrote a paper using sequenced genomes for two individual mammoths. One is a juvenile individual that was found frozen in the ice with soft tissue still intact, and the other is a molar from Rabel Island off the north coast of Siberia, where they got a high quality DNA. So the first specimen from the mainland comes from around 44,000 years ago, at a time when mammoths were plentiful and populations were healthy, and there were lots of mammoths out roaming the open plains. The other specimen comes from Wrangell Island off the north coast of Siberia, and this was the last refuge of mammoths, even after everything else went extinct. And they persisted there for another 6,000 years after everything on the mainland had died off. And just to put this into historical context, this means that civilization has formed, and the pyramids have been built, Ur of the Chaldeans has risen and fallen, Stonehenge is put up in England, and people have started domesticating things like maize in the Americas, and horses, but unfortunately, no one domesticated a woolly mammoth. <laughs> and Rainbow Island, as you can clearly see, is a bleak and desolate place. It is covered with um, scrubby weeds, and um, these Arctic cyclones will come through, and they'll hit the island, and they decimate all the plant life, and so trees cannot grow up on the island because it's hit so often by these high Arctic storms. And that may not sound like the most awesome place to hang out for 6,000 years, but in fact, it was one of the reasons why the mammoths could still survive there. Because trees couldn't grow up like they had on the plains on the mainland, then they could still forage in the scrubby weed and the small patch of grassland. And then because it's in the high North Arctic where it was very dangerous to sail, humans didn't reach there until 3,700 years ago, coincidentally around the time that the mammoths went extinct. Mm -hmm. And so in fact, this habitat was more protected in part because it was so desolate and terrible. One of the questions we often get is how did the mammoths get there? Um, 14,000 years ago, when there were lots of glaciers and ocean levels were lower, then the island was completely connected to the mainland by a combination of, of ice sheets and land bridges. And so the isotopic ratios of strontium to calcium in the mammoth bones suggest that they were going back and forth to forage on the mainland and on the island. And 12,000 years ago, we know that there was a channel between the island and the mainland that was too wide for the mammoths to cross. The isotopic ratios at that point are consistent with them spending their entire lives on this island. What happened in between is apparently a fierce paleontological debate about how, um, how wide the channel was at different points. Were there points when the mammoths could traverse ice sheets only in winter? How far could woolly mammoths swim in Arctic waters? You know, the elephants can swim up to 50 miles a day. They're often some of the first large mammals that reach islands. 
Um, so there's been repeated colonization worldwide of islands just off the coast of the mainland. Um, but how the mammoths got there is a bit of a, a mystery and a debate. But we do know that there was complete isolation of this population by 12,000 years ago. And the signature of isolation is written in the DNA of these uh, woolly mammoths genome. So the result here is from Eleftheria pacopolo, but the figure is one. So the only cone mammoth comes from a point 44,000 years ago when the mammoths were plentiful. And the estimates of effective population sizes for that individual are in between 10 to 15,000 individuals. But the Wrangell Island mammoth, you can see the PSNC plot drops and drops and drops to about 300 individuals at the end. We know that they're going to go extinct and this poor mammoth is doomed. So, we have this huge change in effective population size in a single species, and we have a snapshot before and after that change in effective population size. And Mike Lynch has advocated for theories of nearly neutral evolution defining genome content, especially for genome structure variation. And so as someone who's interested in the evolution of genome structure, this is a really unique opportunity to try to look at this theory and how it might affect the mutations that are present in the genomes of these mammals. And when I looked at the mutations in the woolly mammoth's DNA, it became apparent very quickly that there was what appeared to be an excess of bad mutations accumulating in this woolly mammoth's genome. 50% more of his genes are broken compared to the mammoths from the mainland. There's an excess of deletions. There's an excess in the proportion of deletions that affect gene sequences, an excess in the number of premature stop codons, and an excess in terms of the number of retrogenes, which we think reflects retro element activity, which we usually think is bad. And so it's clear that there's lots of bad mutations in every single class. In my experience, it's kind of rare to have all the mutations in the genome telling exactly the same story. And then the question is, is this unusual? Is this beyond what you would expect for variation in a natural population? It would be great if we could get population genomic data for woolly mammoths, but that's simply not practical at the moment. I hear Loba Gallen's lab might be working on it. But um, so then what do you do? Well, Monty Slacken always says theory is there to tell you what is possible. And so we can use population genetic theory to put bounds on what you would expect from natural variation in population. If you look at the heterozygosity at synonymous sites, which is supposed to reflect ME, then the Ringel Island mammoth lies 28 standard deviations below the Wainu Cone mammoth. So it's just flat out not possible that these two could come from similar populations that operate with similar dynamics. We then look at the ratio of non-synonymous mutations at heterozygous sites to synonymous substitutions at heterozygous sites. And this Wrangell Island mammoth, again, has an excess of non-synonymous substitutions compared to synonymous substitutions versus the main, mainland mammoth. Could this be due to a bottleneck? We haven't excluded a bottleneck. We don't see any sign of a bottleneck based on the PSMC plots or any of the other genetic data. But even if you had a bottleneck, it would not be sufficient to cause the effect that we observe. And that's because HN over HS will lie within a certain distribution and a bottleneck can pull from the tails of that distribution, but it can't move you beyond what you would see in an actual population. And this is clearly beyond the limits of what you can get with a bottleneck. What it is consistent with is this theory of, of genomic meltdown. And in fact, it requires hundreds of generations with a very small effective population size in order to get an effect as extreme as what we saw in this Wrangell Island mammoth. And in fact, the ratio is a little bit higher than what we get out of our simulations. We're not sure if there's a little bit of positive selection on the island that gives you an additional uh, amount of non-synonymous substitutions, or if the simulations are simply very sensitive to parameters like the distribution of fitness effects and the generation times and things like that. Um, but we could not find a, a simulation result that could explain this data without invoking genomic data. So what classes of genes are affected? Well, we see an excess of olfactory receptors and vulnero receptors that are um, damaged by these mutations. It could be that on this island you have these weeds and, and scrubby undergrowth instead of just grasses, and so perhaps they lost some of their olfactory receptors so that they could forage other food sources. It could be that you don't have predators on the island like you did on the mainland, so you don't have to smell them coming. Or it could simply be that when you knock out an olfactory receptor, the mammoths don't drop dead. They still live, they're perfectly fine, they just can't smell. And so any or all of these factors could be influencing the genomic data that we've observed. But alongside these olfactory receptors, we also saw an excess in major urinary proteins that are damaged by these mutations. We know that in elephants, these are important proteins for the social dominance hierarchies and for mate choice. 
And so it's quite possible that there's some co-evolutionary process between olfactory receptors and bone marrow nasal receptors and these urinary proteins that had some sort of interesting biological effect on their behavior, the exact nature of which we don't know. There's also one mutation that seems really interesting because it has a known phenotype in mouse models, and that's a mutation at the locus of FOXQ1. FOXQ1 is a transcription factor. It's responsible for the formation of the inner core of furs as they, they develop. And if you knock out this mutation in mice, the furs become translucent instead of opaque. And it's a trait that's very popular with pet breeders for guinea pigs, rabbits, and mice, and also uh, for people who grow rabbits for the fur. And so this mammoth has a deletion on one haplotype that takes out the entire gene sequence, a large deletion. And on the other haplotype, there's a frame shift mutation that would uh, break the reading frame for this protein. So he has two completely independent, non-functionalizing mutations at these sites that would then knock out the function of this gene. The same gene is pleiotropic. It also helps replenish the cells in the stomach as they replenish and uh, as they're being eroded by stomach acid. So satin fur mutants often have um, digestive trouble and really bad heartburn, and they have to have a special diet. So this poor mammoth, 50% more of his genes are broken compared to the mammoths on the mainland. Um, uh, we also know that mammoths on the island became a little bit shorter, which is a very negative phenotype in modern elephants. We know that his people are going extinct, but at least he was nice and shiny with his translucent fur and really, really ridiculously good looking. <laughs> So with that, I'd like to thank uh, especially Monty Slacken, who was my advisor when I was working at UC Berkeley. And he knows theory like the back of his hand, which is a really important part of this project to put boundaries on what you would expect from natural populations. I'm really struck by the FOXQ1 locus being heterozygous for two deleterious mutations. Yes. That seems phenomenally unlikely. I'm not doubting the result, but do you have any speculation about how that could possibly be? I, um, yeah, I don't know what the mutation rate would be for those. I do know that there's at least one modern elephant that's heterozygous for that same um, frame shift mutation. Uh -huh. But other elephants are not, so it could have been long term segregated variation. Yeah. Um, and I know that pet breeders and various mammals can get that phenotype fairly quickly. Um, and then you, we'd need a deletion on top of that. Yeah. But it's also um, one factor that's been proposed to explain GWAS results and why people don't see, if you don't necessarily have to see the same mutation, but you could have different non functionalizing mutations right. causing disease. Is the genomic meltdown, is it the mutational meltdown mechanism, or is it linked to inbreeding inversion? So, good question. Is it inbreeding, or is it mutational meltdown, right? And so we think it has to be mutational meltdown in order to get these detrimental mutations. The mammoth is also slightly inbred, um, which can explain a homozygosity, but you wouldn't get this type of, of accumulation of detrimental mutations just through them. Um, I assume that it's difficult to tell real mutations from things that happen after the DNA has been dead for a long time. Right, so the DNA damage factor. DNA damage, yeah. yeah. So can you so, briefly say how you deal with that? Yes, yeah, so for the SNP data that's very easy, DNA damage often causes A to G mutations or what look like A to G mutations. When we exclude those, the premature stop codon results and the H and over S results are still qualitatively exactly the same. And then we limited ourselves to very large deletions, in part because of this DNA damage question. If it was causing the reads not to map, it could produce what look like deletions even when they're not. So we only use deletions that are greater than 1 kb, which we believe are much more robust. Shared by any elephant or other mammoth. They had to be new mutations to cause this phenomenon. 